Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Melissa and I'm a librarian at Richmond Hill Public Library. And today we have with us Kat Lucas from Ontario Streams. Uh, thank you so much, Kat, for coming to talk to us about Nature's Neighbors. Um, I think it promises to be a really informative presentation. Um, so I'll hand it over to you, Kat. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Melissa. I'm Kat and I'm the Outreach Coordinator with Ontario Streams. And Ontario Streams is a company that works out of the northern part of the Greater Toronto Area, right at the border of Richmond Hill and Aurora. That's where our office is. But we do work all across Ontario trying to help our rivers, our wetlands, our streams, and try and help all of those different animals that rely on these uh, rivers, wetlands, and streams. So I've got a presentation today and we're going to learn about some of those those neighbors uh, that we have in our own neighborhoods, uh, nature's neighbors specifically, lots of different animals that we have right here in our own neighborhoods. Uh, and we're going to look really at the ones who live in or near the water uh, that are at risk. They are endangered, which we know means that there aren't that many left. So we're going to talk about uh, a handful of different nature's neighbors uh, that need our help. And then at the end, we'll talk about how we can help all of these different animals that live very close to us in Richmond Hill. If we've got questions, I can take them in the chat as we go. And we'll also have time at the end for questions too. Um, if you'd like, you can raise your hand uh, <laughs> if you've got your video on or just type in the chat too. So welcome to everyone. I see we've got uh, a few young ones uh, as well as some older one, ones too. And I, I'm happy uh, that we all came out on this kind of rainy day to learn more about the animals that we have in our own neighborhoods. And to get started, I would like to acknowledge the land that Ontario Streams does work on. It's the traditional territory of many First Nations, including the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, the Mississaugas of the Credit, and many bands of Chippewa. Our First Nations people, they were our first stewards, our first caretakers of the land that we use today. And they took very good care of all of the different animals, the different uh, plants, all of the land and water. They did a great job and they continue to do a great job today. So hopefully from this presentation, we might learn something new about the different animals and plants and land and water that are near us in Richmond Hill. And that'll inspire us, that'll make us feel like we can help too. Here we've got a map and that red dot is Richmond Hill, which I'm sure you are all very familiar with. I live just a, a little bit south of Richmond Hill, but Ontario Streams does lots of work in Richmond Hill, especially near our public libraries like Richvale uh, and Central and Richmond Green. Lots of work that we do around those libraries. But right here in Richmond Hill, we can see that we are near lots of water. Uh, we've got those great lakes, those big blue spots on the map are our Great Lakes. And that is the, uh, our Great Lakes. They are the largest freshwater system we have in the whole world. So maybe a long time ago, you remember going on vacation, maybe you went really far away uh, to an ocean. And if you were swimming in that ocean and you got some salt water in your eyes, it didn't feel very nice. Maybe you drank some, it tasted really yucky. Well, that water that we have in oceans, uh, when you were at California, Florida, Mexico, or even farther away, that water is salt water. It's the kind of water our bodies don't really like. But right here near Richmond Hill, we have fresh water. And that's the kind of water that our bodies like and lots of animals like too. And we are so, so lucky to live where we do near all of this fresh water because it's great for us humans, but it's also great for lots of our animals and plants too. So I've got a question for you. What sort of animals have you seen in your neighborhood? You can raise your hand or unmute or just type in the chat and let me know what you've seen near your home. Oh, squabbies, sparrows. You've seen some sparrows? 
well, well, I'm not a sparrows, but um, like crows, robins, um, robins, and uh, like um, uh, and I also sometimes see some squirrels. Oh, wow. Lots of different kinds of birds and some squirrels. Would anyone else like to share? And we also see a a boat. You went off mute. Abith, did you want to add something? Well, I did want to add that I some that I sometimes also see like like that I also have sometimes see some spider webs and spiders and also there are and also there's a red bird with a red crown. I mean, a bird with a red crown. Oh, maybe a cardinal you've seen. Not a cardinal. I don't oh. think it's a cardinal. Mm. I'm not sure. Lots of different kinds of birds. I see Nerver is adding squirrels and birds. Jennifer, I see your hand up. Owls and deer. Owls and deer. Yeah, we see some of those in our neighborhoods too. Anyone else have anything to add? We've seen raccoons. Um, we've seen cardinals and sparrows. We've seen squirrels. Um, you see lots of in your backyard or your neighborhood too. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you all for sharing. Uh, we've definitely seen lots of wildlife in Richmond Hill, right? Even though it's it's a city, right? We know there's lots of houses, lots of condos and apartments, lots of shopping malls, schools, lots going on in Richmond Hill. But we do have a lot of nature too. Uh, so it's good to hear that you're seeing lots of things near your homes. In Richmond Hill, we have over 350 kinds of animals, plus close to a thousand kinds of bugs. Uh, so we have a lot of different kinds of living things right here in Richmond Hill. We have, of course, things like beavers, which might be a little bit surprising, but we do have beavers in Richmond Hill. Uh, you might be familiar with Beaver Creek, uh, which runs very close to the 404 uh, near uh, 16th Avenue. And there are beavers in Beaver Creek, as well as some other places along the Rouge River in Richmond Hill. We have ladybugs and lots of other kinds of bugs. I said close to a thousand different kinds of bugs. So they are super small neighbors, but we have lots of bugs near us too. Sometimes we might see a coyote in our neighborhood, especially over the past year and a half. So many of us have been home, safe, avoiding going outside. And we've heard that sometimes the coyotes are getting a little bit more brave uh, and they are coming out into our neighborhoods uh, because there aren't as many people around. At the bottom left, we have foxes and kind of the same as those coyotes. We're starting to see a little bit more uh, activity with foxes in our neighborhoods. In the bottom middle, we have turtles, uh, where it's over um, eight, eight kinds of turtles here in Ontario. And Richmond Hill has a bunch of those kinds of turtles right here. And then at the bottom right, we have blue jays. I know many of you said you've seen lots of different kinds of birds from your homes, and uh, blue jays are another one that we have here in Richmond Hill. So lots of different kinds of living things. But some of our living things are called at risk, and that means that there aren't many left. Maybe we've heard of the word endangered before, right? And endangered means there used to be lots of them, but now there aren't that many left. Maybe we've heard the word extinct before when we think about dinosaurs, right? Dinosaurs used to be here, but now they're not. They are gone forever. And that's what extinct means, gone forever. So when we think about endangered, it means that they are getting close to being gone forever. And we want to do everything we can to try and protect these animals. We want to try and protect our neighbors here in Richmond Hill that need our help. And right here in the greater Toronto area, we have about 50 species at risk, 50 animals and plants that need our help. We're gonna talk specifically about the ones that live in or near water today, but I'll just show you the names of these ones as well. On the top left, we have a red side dace. It is a little minnow and we're gonna talk a lot about him today. 
In the middle, we in the top, we have a Jefferson salamander, and those look like little lizards, uh, but they are much more wet and a little bit slimy, and they live here in Richmond Hill too. They like to live under logs. So if you're going around in the spring, you're walking around outside, and if you pick up a log, you might see some little salamanders under there. On the top right, we have barn swallows, a kind of bird that likes to live, of course, in barns. But when we think about Richmond Hill these days, we talked about it being a big city. So we don't have any, we don't have as many barns or farms left in Richmond Hill than we used to many years ago. So these little birds, they like to live in the barn, they'll build their nest in the barn, but now we have less farms, so they're having a hard time finding a good place to live. On the bottom left, we have a, a bird called an Acadian flycatcher. They, of course, like to eat flies. Uh, so we like birds that like to eat bugs for us, especially at this time of year, we've got lots of bugs that like biting us, so we want those birds to be safe. In the middle at the bottom, we have monarch butterflies, and those are sitting on milkweed there. And monarchs, we know they go on a very, very long journey, a migration all the way down to Mexico. Uh, so they fly very, very far, but they like to start their life up here in uh, the greater Toronto area. But monarchs are very, very picky eaters. They will only lay their eggs and the caterpillars will only eat uh, the milkweed flower. That's their favorite place to go. Uh, so we want to make sure that we have lots of milkweed so that we have lots of monarchs. And in the bottom right, we have a snapping turtle and that is the biggest turtle that we have here in Ontario. And we will talk more about that turtle today too. So let's uh, take a, a, a closer look at some of these animals uh, that we have right here in Richmond Hill. They live in or near the water and they need our help. Uh, and this one here is called a red side dace. And you can see has red on its side and dace is just another word for a small fish. It is just a little minnow even as an adult, as a mom or dad, it's only as long as your finger. So they are teeny tiny fish. But they live right here in our rivers, near our homes in Richmond Hill. And they- Can you take a picture? Oh. Why don't you take a picture? Hey, you pass the line. <laughs> well, just make sure that we're on mute, but I'm happy to answer questions if you have a question. But these little red side dace, they are also pretty picky like our monarch butterflies. They need super clean and cool and clear water to survive. So they don't like it if the water is dirty. They don't like it if there's lots of stuff in the water and they can't see. And they also like it to be pretty cold, colder than we would like to swim in for sure. The red side days, though, they are endangered. There's not many left. And that is because they're having a hard time finding good habitat. And habitat is just where an animal likes to live. So they do live right here in the greater Toronto area, in Richmond Hill. However, when we have so many people living in our big cities, there's often more litter, more pollution in our cities which means that the environment is not always really healthy. So these little guys, they are having a hard time finding good, clean and clear water. Uh, and that's what's causing them to, to, um, to struggle right now. Let's move on to another kind of fish that we have here as well. And this is the Atlantic salmon. And maybe many of you have eaten salmon before, right? I'm sure many of us have, if you've ever had a kind of pink or orange fish uh, for dinner, maybe in sushi, maybe uh, from a can, that is uh, usually salmon. Our Atlantic salmon, used to live right here in Lake Ontario in the greater Toronto area. However, about 150 years ago, uh, our Atlantic salmon started to go 
down. And that is uh, because when our first settlers came here from overseas, they saw all of these salmon in our Great Lakes and they said, wow, and they very quickly fished them down to nothing. Uh, and so for almost for over 100 years, we haven't had Atlantic salmon in Lake Ontario. However, we know that some people do eat Atlantic salmon, and there are still lots and lots of Atlantic salmon in the Atlantic Ocean. So it's okay if we're still eating Atlantic salmon. They're not the ones that we, uh, we want to protect here in our Great Lakes. They're from the ocean, and there's lots there. However, the ones that live right here in Lake Ontario, they were super cool because they were what we called a landlocked population. Maybe we've thought we've learned about salmon before and we know salmon do a migration, right? That big journey. And a lot of salmon, they go from fresh water to salt water out into the ocean and then they come back to fresh water to have their babies. Well, the salmon that we have in Lake Ontario, they never went all the way out to the ocean. They saved all their energy. They just went from the river to Lake Ontario and back. So they could have lots more babies because they were having a shorter migration, right? If we think about if we have to run really far, uh, if we're walking to school or running to school, uh, we're pretty tired by the time we get there. Uh, but when you have a shorter distance to go, you have more energy. And Atlantic salmon, they have a really cool life cycle. Maybe we've learned before about our frogs or butterflies that go through metamorphosis, right? They change, they have lots of different stages in their life. Atlantic salmon, they also have lots of changes. It's not really a metamorphosis because they stay the same shape, but they still have lots of different stages. They start their life as an egg. And we can see on the top left, we've got a bunch of little salmon eggs in there. They are about the size of a green pea. If you've ever played with Orbeez before, they look a lot like orange Orbeez. From there, they hatch into what we call an Alvin, kind of like Alvin and the chipmunks. And that's what we see in the top middle there. They're only about a centimeter long, basically just as big as your thumb. We also see they've got a big orange blob on their tummy, and that's called a yolk sac. And that is like their built-in fridge. Uh, that's where they get all of their nutrients. Uh, and it's very helpful because as baby fish, their mom and their dads don't take care of them. They say, see ya. And the little baby has to survive on their own. This way they can hide in the gravel. Nobody can find them to try and eat them. And they can absorb all of this nutrients, all of this healthy food inside their yolk sac, that built-in fridge, so they can get bigger and stronger before they have to go out and catch their own food. On the top right, we see um, them at a life stage called a fry, kind of like a French fry, about the same size a little French fry. And then they keep growing. At the bottom, we see a smolt. And that's like the teenager stage. This is when they start their migration. And then finally, at the end, we see them as the full size adult. There's lots of different organizations who are trying to bring back the Atlantic salmon in Lake Ontario. And Ontario Streams is one of them. So in those top two pictures, we see them in these containers. And that is called an incubation tray. And basically, it's like a little condo for the little salmon eggs and the little alvin. And they hide and stay in there for about, about six weeks or so. They'll stay in there until they're bigger and safe uh, to go out into the tank. And this helps keep them separated and stops the spread of any disease so they don't get sick. Kind of like we're all staying home. They're, not, they're all staying in their little homes, too. But we are trying to bring back the salmon. So we actually raise them in tanks, uh, usually with school groups. We bring them into the classroom and the students get to raise them. And then we go release them out into the wild. This past year, Ontario Streams released about 11,000 baby Atlantic salmon into different rivers across uh, the greater Toronto area. So we're really trying to bring them back. 
But we're going to switch things up now and look at a different kind of animal. And that is the Western Chorus Frog. And these little guys are pretty small. They're only about four centimeters long. So again, shorter than your finger. And they, uh, they have nice tan or brown uh, skin. And then they've got little mask on their eyes, kind of like a superhero uh, with a little bit of the darker uh, coloring around their eyes. And then they have some nice white lips. They are one of the first one that comes out in the spring. So if you're ever on a walk near a wetland in the spring, maybe you've been over to Newbury Park in Richmond Hill and that is a wetland, you might hear these little frogs. And their sound uh, sounds like a fingernail on a comb. So if you do this, you can find a comb at home. I'm not sure if you can hear, but that's how they sound, just like a fingernail on a comb. And these little guys, uh, they can actually freeze solid in the winter. Uh, they will go into the water and they will become like a little popsicle and they will freeze right through and then they will melt and thaw uh, when the spring comes. Nervair, I see your hand up. You have a question? You can unmute or write in the chat. Oh no, that must have happened because on my computer I can't do that. So it must have accidentally clipped. <laughs> no problem. These little frogs, though, they are also endangered. And that is because they are finding less good habitat to live in. They're having a hard time finding the nice wetlands they need to survive. And that is because humans, we want to build more schools, more shopping malls, more homes, more roads. And we are, are taking away the different parts of nature to build for ourselves. And these little guys can't find as many good spots to live. But frogs, they are so important because they love to eat bugs. And I don't know about you, but I don't really love mosquitoes. I've got so many mosquito bites already this year. But frogs are great for eating things like mosquitoes. Uh, and that keeps those mosquito numbers down so we get less bug bites. And now let's look at snapping turtles. Oh, Nervair, do you have a question? No, it just keeps on happening. <laughs> All right, no problem. So these snapping turtles, they are the largest turtle that we have here in Ontario, but they start uh, as a little baby, as a super, super small turtle. They will be about the size of a toonie. And we see in that top left picture, that is a snapping turtle baby beside a quarter. So we can just see how teeny tiny they are as babies but they get really big as adults. They can get to be about 50 centimeters long across their shell. Uh, and that's you know probably about half your height uh, for many of you joining me today. But they are, are very, very big, but their shell is actually pretty small compared to the size of their body. And we've seen lots of turtles, I'm sure, on TV, in the movies, in books, who can pull themselves all the way inside their shell. And that's how they stay safe. With a snapping turtle, though, they can't fit. Their, their head is too big. Their arms are too big. Their legs are too big. They can't fit all the way into their shell. So if somebody is being mean to them, maybe there's a raccoon who's trying to take him for dinner. Uh, unfortunately, they can't pull themselves in like another turtle could. So instead, what they do is they will snap, and that's how they got their name. Uh, they snap, they try to bite anybody who's trying to pick on them uh, because they can't fit inside their shell. So they, they try and uh, bite back at anybody who's trying to, to fight them. But snapping turtles, they are another animal that we have that's endangered, right? There's not as many left, and that is because most of our turtles, uh, they like to move between land and water. And especially when the mom turtles are ready to lay their eggs, they want a really, really nice spot to have their nest. And they will search very long and very far to find a good spot to lay their eggs. And usually that means they are up on land walking around for quite a while trying to find somewhere perfect. 
These days, though, in Richmond Hill, we have lots and lots of roads. And unfortunately, when a turtle is looking for a good spot to lay their eggs, it usually means they have to cross a road. And sometimes people aren't driving, um, they're driving pretty fast and they don't see the turtles on the road or coming onto the road. And sometimes turtles get hit by cars. That's not very nice uh, because it takes a very, very long time for a turtle to be old enough to lay eggs. Something like a snapping turtle, it could take almost 20 years before they are ready to lay their eggs. That's 20 years they have to stay alive uh, and try and find uh, a partner to, to lay those eggs with. Uh, it's a, a very long time when we think about animals and how long it will take for that, their bodies to be ready to start their family. So we want to be careful if we ever see these turtles while we're driving. If we see them, if it's safe for us to stop the car, safe for us to help the turtle, of course we need an adult with us. Uh, we can get out of our car safely and we can take the mat that's on the bottom of our car, uh, like our little, um, like underneath our feet. And what we can do, we've got a piece of paper here, we'll pretend this is a car mat. And what we will do is we will tuck it under the turtle. We can wrap the turtle up and then carry him across the road like a little taco or a little burrito and let them go on the other side of the road. That's a good way to keep them safe and help them in the direction they're going. We don't want to turn the turtle around because they actually have a little compass inside their head that helps them decide which direction they are going to go to find the best place to lay their eggs. So if we just turn them around, they're going to say, "Ooh." I know the better places over there. Uh, so we'll move them the direction they were going so that they can get there a little bit faster and safer as well. And turtles like the snapping turtle, they actually eat mostly dead things. Uh, so they are really helpful to our environment uh, and our ecosystems because they eat lots of dead things, uh, which keeps it moving uh, and, and keeps our, our area clean. Then we'll switch it up to another turtle, and this is the Blanding's turtle. And I think it is probably the cutest turtle that we have here in Ontario. We see they've got that bright yellow under their chin, and they are often called the, the turtle with the sun under their chin, uh, because of course we see all that bright yellow. They are very significant uh, to many Indigenous cultures, uh, as <laughs> and that's how they got their name. That's from a story about how they actually pulled up the sun uh, and, and the sun stayed right on its chin. They are a medium sized turtle, probably only about 20 centimeters, maybe, maybe 30, uh, if you're looking at a very big Blanding's turtle. And they have a pretty domed shell. Sometimes they are called a, a helmet head turtle because it's just like a little helmet. They're not so flat. If we go back to that snapping turtle, they're very flat, but these guys have a much bigger bump on their shell. And we talked about how the snapping turtle can't fit inside. Well, the Blanding's turtle is extra special because it actually has a hinge on the bottom of its shell. And when it pulls itself in, it can actually hinge it closed uh, so that it's really, really hard for somebody like a raccoon to try and, and fight them. Blanding's turtles, though, they are very, very endangered. There are not many left. Again, part of the reason is they are crossing roads. And Blanding's turtles, they will actually spend more time on land than most of our other turtles in Ontario. And they can look for about seven kilometers, they'll walk around trying to find the best spot to lay their eggs. So when we think about seven kilometers, for us walking, that's maybe about two hours of walking. Uh, but for a little turtle like this, we know they're very slow. Uh, so that could be days and days that they are walking and trying to find a good place to lay their eggs. And that means that they're crossing likely lots of roads. In the greater Toronto area, it's hard to find a place where we have less um, than one road per, per kilometer, right? And when we think about uh, the blocks in our neighborhood, they are very close together. So it's a, a lot of walking and likely crossing a lot of roads as a Blanding's turtle. 
And then to switch things up again, this is called uh, an Eastern pond mussel. And it is a kind of freshwater mussel, which is a fancy word for a clam or an oyster. Um, it's a shell, right? And the, inside that shell is a living thing. These guys are in the same family as a snail, right? So they've got a hard outside shell, and then on the inside is a squishy living thing, kind of like a slug. Uh, it doesn't have any eyes. Uh, it looks very different than most things uh, that we know as animals. But these eastern pond mussels, we can see just about how long they are, probably about 10 centimeters long or so. Uh, they're kind of on the medium size of freshwater mussels that we find here in Ontario. Ontario is actually Canada's freshwater mussel hotspot. That means that we have a lot of different kinds of these freshwater clams right here. However, about two thirds of all of our freshwater mussels in Canada are listed as at risk or endangered, and they really need our help. Maybe you're thinking it looks kind of boring uh, <laughs> and you might be right. I, it's not as exciting as most other animals that we know and love, but these mussels are really, really important because they actually clean our water. What they do is we call them filter feeders. Maybe you have a water filter in your fridge, right? And that basically takes anything not so nice out of our water. So it's nice and clean for us when we're ready to drink it. These guys do the same thing. They will open up their shell, they'll take in some water, and they will eat things that us humans don't really like. Uh, they like to eat E. coli, which is a kind of bacteria, and that's not good for us. If we get E. coli, we feel pretty yucky. They also like to eat algae, which is kind of that green or blue uh, kind of gunky stuff that we sometimes see on top of our water out in nature. That, again, is not so good for us humans. We don't like to swim in algae. It gets all icky on us. And sometimes algae can be toxic. It can be really harmful to us humans and our pets. Sometimes we, if we see algae, it's a good idea for us not to let our dogs go in that water because there are some kinds of algae that can make our dogs sick. But these mussels, they will clean the water for us. So we wanna make sure there's lots of them out there to eat all that algae and eat all that bacteria. And then they spit the water out and it's cleaner than it was before. So they are super, super helpful keeping our water clean for us humans and all other living things too. Unfortunately, we are seeing less of them too. And most of that is because of an invasive species called the zebra mussel. And an invasive species just means it's some sort of living thing, some sort of animal. It's come from somewhere else in the world, and now it's here, and it's causing problems with our animals who've always lived here. So those little zebra mussels, maybe you've seen them before. Maybe you've been to a cottage or you've been out in nature and seen them before. They are pretty small, probably about the size of your thumbnail, and they are striped like a little zebra. They are not good because they can make lots and lots of them very fast and they will eat all of the food and they will take out all of the habitat space. Uh, and then our poor mussels who've always been here, they have a hard time finding food and a hard time finding a good spot to live. So we want to make sure that we try and reduce, uh, try and uh, limit the number of zebra mussels that we have so that our native freshwater mussels can uh, still have lots and lots. I see we've got a question here about whether it is safe to eat these mussels. And traditionally, uh, freshwater mussels were eaten. Uh, however, today, it's generally um, humans are eating saltwater mussels. They are grown in salt water in our oceans and uh, and inland uh, facilities as well, uh, but they are living in that salt water. They pick up the taste of the salt, and that's what uh, humans generally find uh, yummy. 
However, with our freshwater mussels, they are, are probably not going to be as tasty and are often just eaten by things like raccoons and skunks. And if you're ever out for a walk uh, near water and you see a little pile of shells on the, um, the side of the stream or the side of the lake, uh, that usually shows that a raccoon has been digging in there, collecting a bunch of shells, prying them open, eating them, and then tossing them aside. Uh, so we can see that for sure, lots of, uh, of our <laughs> raccoons are eating them. And I guess the question about whether they are safe or not, as I said, they are filter feeders. They are eating the stuff that we generally don't like in the water. Uh, so they, they can accumulate and get a lot of this inside of them. So again, freshwater mussels are, are likely not something that we want to eat as humans, especially if they're an area like the greater Toronto area, somewhere with lots of humans and likely lots of pollution, uh, not going to be a very good choice for us here. However, maybe if you're somewhere farther away from uh, a big city, they might be uh, something you could try. Any other questions while we're here? We just saw the one come in. All right. So I, I talked a lot about some of our different neighbors that we have right here in Richmond Hill that need our help. But why should we care, right? Why should we care about trying to protect the nature and the different animals that we have near us? And there's lots of research out there that says that nature is so important and so helpful for us. Uh, it can help us reduce stress, right? Make us feel happier. It can improve our memory and attention span boost our immunity, energy levels, creativity, right? After spending some time in nature, it usually really lifts your mood and maybe you're feeling extra creative and extra ready to go. Uh, it of course improves physical fitness and coordination, right? If we're out on a hike, we have to pay attention, make sure that we're stepping in the right spots and not hurting ourselves and so much more. Uh, so we really do wanna protect all of the nature that we have right here in Richmond Hill and all around the world too. So what, what is Ontario Streams doing to help, right? I started by saying that we're an environmental organization, right? So we care about the nature that's around us and we really wanna help it. Uh, so something we do is we try and fix habitats, uh, which we sometimes call habitat restoration, right? We're trying to fix them and bring them back uh, to a really good, healthy habitat. So we've got two pictures here. The one on the left is a before picture and the one on the right is after. And this is a cow farm up in Vaughan. So again, not too far from Richmond Hill. And in this, in this river, we, it, it's called Purpleville Creek. And it is a, a little river that is attached to the Rouge. Uh, and we've got in here red side dace, which are those little fish that we talked about right at the beginning with that bright red on their side. And this is a cow farm and the cows, they would come right into the water, splash it all up. They would make the water really murky and unclear, right? All of the mud and sand gets kicked up every time the cows go in there. And we said red side dace, they like really clear water. Uh, they like to eat insects and things like mosquitoes and they need to jump up out of the water to catch those mosquitoes. But if the water is really murky, they can't see and then they can't jump and find their food. So we helped by putting up all of this fencing uh, to help keep the cows out of the water as much as possible. We've got some, some good places for them to cross, but they won't just stand around in the water and make it really mucky anymore. And we also planted hundreds of plants along the stream. And plants are important because they create shade, right? If we think about on a hot summer day uh, and we go sit under a tree and we're in the shadow of the tree, it's nice and cold. Uh, and we like that with our rivers too. And when we put plants nearby, it keeps the water cold. And it also creates somewhere where uh, the insects, the bugs like to sit and hang out. Uh, so things like mosquitoes, they like to sit on the plants that are near the water and that brings them closer to the water so then these fish can eat them. These two pictures are only three months apart. So you can really see all of those changes uh, with so many new plants and really clean up the water and help keep those cows out of it for the most part. 
We also do other kind of work in the water too and, and fix these habitats in the river. When uh, on a day like today where it's really, really rainy, all of that rain goes onto our streets and then down the sewer. And the sewers are connected to our rivers. So when we have lots of water that come off the roads through the sewer into our rivers, it moves super fast, kind of like a power washer if you've ever washed your car. And that water shoots really fast and it actually carves out our banks. Uh, and it's not good because it means that there's lots of soil and sand and clay that gets into our water. And we said that lots of fish like the water to be nice and clear. And it also means that the, the trees that are on the river bank can sometimes fall in. So in the picture on the left, we see that there's right in the middle, there's a big overhang. There's lots of roots with nothing, uh, no more soil for them to sit in because the water has pushed it all away. We call that erosion. And what we do is we come and we bring Christmas trees, uh, just like the ones we have at home, but the real Christmas trees, and we stick them underneath uh, to try and create a place for soil to start filling in. And then those roots in the trees can have new soil to hold on to. And all of these Christmas trees in the water, they actually make a nice habitat somewhere nice and safe for our fish to hide in. Uh, so everybody wins uh, when we try and, and fix these habitats. And we also plant lots of trees. Richmond Hill was actually named a, a tree city of the world uh, because of their commitment to trying to plant lots and lots of trees. Uh, and that's a, a really wonderful designation for Richmond Hill, a really big award. And so we've been working with Richmond Hill for many years uh, to plant lots and lots more trees here. And when we plant trees, again, we're making a good home for insects, for bugs, for birds, all different kinds of living things like to live in trees. And trees are also helpful because they can clean water as it moves into the, the ground. It can also hold on to water after a storm so that there's less flooding. So we really like to plant trees and shrubs in Richmond Hill, especially close to water. But how are some ways that we can protect our animal neighbors, right? We said, well, like a big company like Ontario Streams, we can do lots of really big projects, but we all as, as people can do lots too. One thing we can do is to be careful about what ends up in nature, right? I'm sure many of us have seen litter over the past year and a half as well as before and we want to be careful that we're not making that much litter or if we see litter and it's safe we pick it up and put it in the garbage all of that litter is just garbage that's up that's in nature and it's not very nice some animals can get stuck in it or eat it by accident and that's not going to make them feel very good so we want to try and get the litter out of the environment I know we don't want to think about winter right now uh, while we're right in the middle of summer, but we want to remember next uh, winter about road salts and try and use less. We see people putting salt on the road, sidewalks, driveways, and when the snow starts to melt, all of that um, salt goes down our drains into our sewers and then can make its way into our rivers and our lakes. And right at the beginning, we talked about how our water close to home is fresh water. So when we put all of that salt into our rivers and our lakes, our fish are not happy about that. They say yuck, uh, just like we say yuck when we go swimming in salt water. So we wanna try and use less salt or try to find some different things that we can use instead of salt. And we also want to be careful about what we put down our drains in our own homes, right? Because our bathtubs, our sinks, our toilets are all connected to the sewers, which are connected to our lakes and our rivers. So we don't want to put anything down there that might not be very nice uh, to end up in nature. Things like chemicals, when we're cleaning our, our homes, make sure we try to buy cleaning products that are a little bit more eco-friendly. We also don't wanna put things like plastic down the drain, especially things like glitter, which is just teeny tiny pieces of plastic. We wanna be careful so that we don't put things that might bother our fish friends later on. 
I'm sure we know our three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, but we've got two new layers up on top. We have rethink, which is about thinking about what we do every day, the different activities we do, the different things we use, and try and think if those are good for the environment, if they are good for nature. If they are not so good, maybe we'll think of some better things we can do instead. We also have refuse, which means to say no to those things that are not good for nature. I know lots of us are getting takeout these days, and maybe the next time we go for takeout for dinner and they offer us some uh, forks or knives, we just say no thank you, we don't need the plastic forks or knives, and we just wait till we get home so we can use our own forks and knives instead of making more garbage. Reduce means that we want to use less and try and um, not have as much garbage or waste. Reuse means that we are going to keep using the things we already have and stop buying more and more new things and just buy more, uh, just buy when we need to. And then of course we have recycle, which means that we will put things in the blue bin. Right now in Ontario, the blue bin program isn't working as well as we would like. However, our government said that by 2022, we will have a new recycling program that will get us all working uh, together to try and recycle all of our plastic, paper, uh, and metal, uh, and make sure that it's and glass uh, to make sure that we're using it as best as we can. York Region also has lots of programs to help residents. Uh, we've got um, some programs where you can actually buy some trees or shrubs to plant in your backyard or neighborhood. Uh, we've got lots of ash trees in York Region uh, that are dying due to an invasive species, the emerald ash borer. Uh, so they are looking to replace those trees. We've also got partnerships with local enhancement and appreciation of forests, also called LEAF, uh, which is a great group that's trying to plant more and more trees. Uh, and they have programs to, to plant even in condo or apartment complexes. Uh, so you don't need a backyard to take advantage of these programs. They also have some webinars that you can check out on York Region website as well uh, to learn how to um, better your own backyard if you have one or your neighborhood too and, and try and get uh, our communities as green as possible. Some other things we can do is to save water and energy. Uh, we've got the average Canadian uses about 330 liters of water every single day and that is a lot a lot of water. However, in Richmond Hill, you're already doing really great using about 230 liters of water a day. So already using 100 liters of water per person, uh, less than the average Canadian. So that's pretty wonderful. But we can see that the biggest chunk of our water usage is coming from bathing and showering. So even something like taking a little bit of a shorter shallow, shorter shower or a shallower bath uh, can really make a difference in trying to use less water. And we also want to save energy too. Uh, and when we can, we'll make sure we turn off the lights if we're not in a room, unplug devices or appliances that we're not using try and uh, be a little more active and take the car only when necessary, uh, or even take public transit or walking or biking or <laughs> running to school to uh, back when we return to school in September are great things that we can do to help nature. We can also support Ontario streams. Uh, we are just getting started uh, to hold some in-person uh, programs now. We just had our first garbage pickup of the year just yesterday. Uh, usually we have many, many public events to try and help nature. So you can keep uh, an eye on our social media pages if you're interested in uh, helping out in the community. And that's everything I've got for you today. So we do have some social media pages for uh, the adults in the audience today who'd like to, to keep an eye on any upcoming events. And I've also got my email there if you have any questions after this event and would like to, to follow up. I'm happy to, to connect with you through email. And we are ready to take some questions too. If we've got any, you can write in the chat or unmute yourself. Thank you so much, Kat. That was great. 